let me just say again what I've said before, which is that um, Madison saved my father and my family, and uh, the least I can do is thank you every year for, for that, and this is part of my thank you. So thanks for coming tonight. As Paul said, I, I, I met Carl 45 years ago, um, though he was long gone from the post by then. No, uh, the well, you're gone by the time I got there, yes. Um, uh, but we met primarily through Bob Woodward, who was my first boss at the paper and then my colleague and close friend. Um, but I actually had a connection to Carl and Bob before I'd met either of them, um, which is that uh, when you were covering Watergate, uh, the Capital Times subscribed to the Washington Post News Service. And whenever you, Woodward and Bernstein had a story, my father would banner it on the top of the front page. <laughs> and I was working at WIBA Radio. Um, and I would take that story and rewrite it into radio uh, length and maybe call up uh, an actuality from the White House, like Ron Ziegler calling it a third rate burglary or whatever, and put together a package. So I've joked with Woodward that I was rewriting him long before I met him. But, <laughs> but so were you. I mean, <laughs> many, many times. Um, I, you know, Bob is actually a little bit underappreciated as a writer. He's great at creating scenes, but you were the real wordsmith of the, of the, you know, of the we two. Were talking about it last night. Here. It's a miracle if I'm the technician of the two of us. <laughs> ah, try it now. Hey, man. If I can get this on. They can hear you now. They can hear you, but I don't have the damn thing on. <laughs> there. How's that? Can you all hear? <laughs> I'm not only a Luddite, I'm bad at hardware stores. <laughs> I don't go to hardware stores. <laughs> I get a panic attack. But as I was saying, <laughs> we reverse roles in Watergate, the expected things of one, the other would do. And, and we were together last night uh, in Iowa City, and, and the same thing occurred, and Bob made note of it to the audience about the unexpected switching of, of, of roles. Well, that's, that's what happens with, when you're that close together in so many ways. Um, you know, Carl wrote um, two books with Bob, uh, All the President's Men, of course, the classic, and The Final Days. Um, but he's also written several other books. And each one of them has some kind of a direct connection that I feel towards you. I mean, first he wrote about the Pope, His Holiness. I never wrote about a Pope, but I did write about Vince Lombardi, who was the Pope of Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> and then he wrote a, a wonderful book about the McCarthy era, Loyalties, which uh, about his family's experience. And that really, I, I read it three times when I was writing my book about what my father had done. It really served as a benchmark for all of that. Then he wrote a book about Hillary Clinton. I certainly knew her uh, from my own coverage of, of, of Bill and Hillary. And then he wrote Chasing History, which as Paul said, is such a remarkable evocation. Wait, what are you guys saying? Want me to do it for you? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit what? Away from my tie? No, closer to your mouth. It's going to be quite an evening. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Start over. <laughs> Anyway, I consider Chasing History uh, the greatest evocation of what it was like to be in a newsroom in the late 50s and early 60s. But even more than that, I think every journalism student in America should read it because of the way Carl teaches you how to train yourself to become a reporter, all that you do to make yourself a great reporter. Um, so anyway, Carl, thank you for coming. Welcome to Wisconsin. I'm glad you got here on a nice day. I'm really happy to be here. We're going to talk about a lot of subjects that are somewhat 
serious, I mean, very serious and ominous and threatening. So I thought it was best to start and maybe end with something that's a little lighter. So I was watching uh, you and Bob on the Colbert show, and I, I actually broke out laughing out loud when you told this, when you, two of you told the story about Martha Mitchell's call. Can you tell the audience about that? Sure. Moment? Uh, Martha Mitchell, the wife of the former Attorney General of the United States, Nixon's campaign manager, former law partner, uh, was a figure in Watergate really misunderstood, including by, by the recent television series about her. Uh, she did not know that much about Watergate, but what she did know was that something had happened and was being covered up. And she knew that from the first days because it was true that she had been bound and drugged uh, because she had a habit of getting drunk and calling newspaper people. Uh, and so there came a point at a very crucial point in, in Watergate, a little bit before, uh, it was during the tapes controversy over Nixon's tapes. And she one night, uh, Woodward got a call and it was Martha Mitchell. And she said, the son of a bitch left me. And uh, OK, so she said, she said um, you know, he left behind a whole lot of papers and stuff. Would you all like to come up and <laughs> take a look? <laughs> sure, Martha. <laughs> uh, you never saw two guys get to National Airport faster than we did. <laughs> And uh, we got on the Eastern shuttle and went up there. And this huge apartment, uh, Mitchell had been a bond trader and made a fortune. And huge apartment with all kinds of chintz this, and chintz that. Uh, but, and she showed us around. Meanwhile, she greeted us drinking a martini. And, and she showed us around. We just wanted to get the goods, but we kind of, you know. Uh, but we asked her some things and, and it was clear her knowledge was, was really not great. But she took us into John Mitchell's study and she said, in that closet, that's where all the, all the books and records are. But his closet must have been 12 feet high, like the ceiling height of the place. And there, there were shelves, but the shelves were about eight feet high. And so somebody had to go up there, climb up there and get this stuff. Uh, and that was me. <laughs> and how did you do that? Um, I, got, I got a stool or a chair, uh, John Mitchell's chair perhaps, uh, and got up there and went like this, crawled in his little crawl space up at the top. And, and there were a lot of leather bound volumes, check, you know, the kind you get from a bank. Uh, and all kinds of papers. And I would go like that and say, here, Woodward, take this one, take that one. And, and by the time it was over, uh, we had a stack of documents like that. They were not as promising as we had hoped, but nonetheless, um, they were helpful. They were helpful at a crucial time uh, in, in showing once again uh, the criminality and mindset of the President of the United States uh, and those, many of those who served him. And they tried to get him back, right? The papers. So, yes. Yeah. So, so then, uh, Bill Hundley, a great lawyer who, who somebody Bob and I both knew for a long time. He had been the assistant attorney general previously, and he was Mitchell's lawyer. And he called Woodward and he said, I want everything you've got. And Woodward said, just a minute, you know, let's, let's calm down a little bit. And uh, Woodward called me, and uh, I, we agreed, we'll, we'll get back to you, Bill. <laughs> but what we did was very logical. We copied everything. <laughs> and we gave it back to Hundley. That's crazy. Should, should I tell the other John Mitchell story now? Yeah, or, please, why, why don't you? Because yeah. <laughs> I was going to get to it. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 you tell it now. John Mitchell became obviously one of the central figures in Watergate. And about eight weeks in, eight weeks after the break in that occurred on June 17th, 1972, 
We had learned from the bookkeeper of the committee to reelect the president, knocking on her door at night, that there was a secret fund controlled by five people, uh, many of them close to the president, that had paid for the undercover activities, not just the Watergate break-in, but other undercover activities against uh, Nixon's Democratic opponents. And we knew that, that uh, these five people uh, had, had great influence. And one by one, we started learning who they were. And we got to John Mitchell as the third person. And, uh, and Ben Bradley, our editor, we, we took all our information to him, said, look, we've got it. He said, you sure you can't be wrong here? Uh, because you're about to do a story unlike any that there's ever been. You're going to call the former Attorney General of the United States a crook. And we took a deep breath and, and, and said, no, we, we're, all, we're all right. So <clears throat> I called the White House for a comment on the story. The story went into the paper at uh, 8 o'clock that night. And right before, I called the White House for a comment and got an assistant press secretary and read him the story. The first paragraph was John N. Mitchell, while Attorney General of the United States, controlled a secret fund that paid for undercover activities against uh, Nixon's political opposition. And so I called this assistant press secretary. I read him the story. I said, can we get your response? He said, the sources of the Washington Post are a fountain of misinformation. I typed that out. I said, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> repeated, the sources of the Washington Post are a fountain of misinformation, I type. And I said, well, aside from this geyser that's going off in our backyard, <laughs> is the story true? <laughs> sources of the Washington Post are a fountain of mis misinformation. Well, as, as David will, will remember, we called these non-denial denials, and they were very effective. Our stories were not believed by most of our brethren in, in the Washington press corps and by many people who were reading them in the paper. And one reason was these non-denial denials making our conduct at the Washington Post with this geyser going off behind us the issue rather than the president and those around him. So I had a, a phone number for John Mitchell and I just said, the hell with this. I'm going to call John Mitchell. I think I can get a hold of him and see what he says. So he answered in that same apartment up in, in New York. And uh, I said, I, we had this story. We, we would, could I read it to him? And he would respond to it. And would you respond to it, Mr. Attorney General? So he said, sure. I got as far as John N. Mitchell, while Attorney General of the United States, controlled a secret fund. And Mitchell said, Jesus. <laughs> And I read a few more words into this control the secret fund that paid for the undercover activities. And on that word, he said, Jesus. <laughs> then I got to the end of the first paragraph, by which time the drift of the whole story was unmistakable. He took a breath and said, Jesus Christ, all that crap you're putting it in the paper. If you print that, Katie Graham, referring to Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post, is going to get her tit caught in a big fat ringer. <laughs> I instinctively jumped back from the phone, more worried about <laughs> my parts than Mrs. Graham's. <laughs> there was a pause, and then he said, and when this campaign is over, we're going to do a little story on you two boys and he hung up the phone. And I can tell you here in 62 or however many years since I went to work, you know, 62 years ago in, in this business, it's the most chilling moment I ever had working in, in the business. Because he meant it. I don't know if he meant physical harm. We didn't know if he meant physical harm. We knew that one of the burglars, Gordon Liddy, uh, had threatened to kill Jack Anderson, a columnist. Uh, but more than anything, it was a threat against the newspaper. It was a threat against the First Amendment. It was a threat to saying that this presidency did not believe there could be a free functioning press. So I called Ben Bradley, the editor of the Post at home. I didn't know what to do with this response. And Bradley said, you got good notes? I said, yeah. Uh, he said, well, put it all in the paper, but leave her tit out. 
<laughs> That's so classic, Bradley. The next morning, Mrs. Graham came by my desk and said, Carl, do you have any more messages for me? <laughs> and then to bring it full circle, and I didn't mean to take too much time on this, but on the first day of the Watergate, or the day John Mitchell was to testify at the Watergate hearings, Bill Hundley, whom I knew well and just told you about, brought Mitchell over to meet me and for me to meet him. And so he said, Carl, it's John Mitchell, John Mitchell, it's Carl. Mitchell said, I know, we talk on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Carl, I don't know if you've seen the, the new Post newsroom. Uh, no. But anyway, it has a lot of quotes from Ben Bradley on it. And that quote's not there. <laughs> <laughs> but that leads into my, my next thought, which is um, sort of a confession on my part that, you know, I've felt naive, that I was naive my whole life. That, you know, I, I know what my father endured during the McCarthy era. I've read Sinclair Lewis and Philip Roth. And yet, until the last few years, I never really felt, even through Watergate, that there could be this much of a serious threat on democracy and so much authoritarianism. I imagine you were not as naive as me, but... I think everybody that I know during the last five years has been horrified and disbelieving at first. Look, Joe McCarthy, who came from here, vicious, awful, demagogue, liar, he was not the president of the United States. Father Coughlin was not the president of the United States. There has never been a president of the United States like this one. We can talk about comparisons with Nixon, who was also a criminal president, but this is of a, a very different order and far more grievous. That Donald Trump is a seditious president. We've never had a seditious president in this country unless you Count Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. And Bob and I just wrote a 50th, uh, an introduction to the 50th anniversary edition of All the President's Men. And we say in there, he committed sedition. Flat out. And we define what sedition is. Imagine. And he, look, he, we've never had an authoritarian president such, such as he. Uh, and we can go on and on. But there's been a cold civil war in this country that's gone on for 40 years. Trump has ignited it. That the horror, one of the horrors of, of this, and, and we're going to learn a lot more about January 6th, incidentally. And, and already there is enough there. Bob and I, Bob gave a litany last night of, of what some of the basic things are known. And if you want to go back, you can put a chronology together from January 4th, when Bannon summons uh, Trump and says, you've got to get, uh, get your ass back up here. Uh, and then the meetings at the Willard Hotel, etc. There is right there a circumstantial case uh, that any prosecutor would love to have for promoting insurrection, etc., uh, etc. Et but also, we, we need to think about Republicans are in many ways the heroes of Watergate. Those votes on the House Judiciary Committee by courageous Southern Republicans to vote for articles of impeachment. Barry Goldwater, the 1964 nominee of his party. When Woodward and I wrote the final days, we went to see Goldwater and he poured each of us a whiskey and himself pulled out his diary and read to us from his meeting along with the Republican leaders of the House and Senate a day before Nick, two days before Nixon resigned, Nixon was refusing to leave office. Goldwater led this delegation to the White House, sat across from Nixon in the Oval Office. Nixon said, and it was a foregone conclusion, the House was going to impeach him. Nixon said, Barry, how many votes do I have in the Senate? You needed two-thirds uh, to convict. 
Nixon still had some hopes that he, he could pull that off. And Goldwater looked at him and he said, Mr. President, right now you may have four to six votes, but you don't have mine. Wow. Think of Mitch McConnell doing that. <laughs> so, so one of the huge differences between Watergate and what has happened now is the Republican Party, which has become a, you know, a vessel uh, for Donald Trump's, the worst of Donald Trump. And why is that? I mean, you, you know a lot of these Republicans. Um, what do you, and they know better. Well, that's the point. Right? I, I finally did a story for CNN in the, in the last year of, uh, of Trump's presidency saying, and I, I'm so, I got so tired of hearing how the Republicans in the Senate, how many of them really despised and disdained Trump, but were, were afraid of him. And they were craven and continue to be. And, and so I did a story naming 21 senators, naming them. And I didn't abrogate any you know, pledges of confidentiality because Yes, I knew some stuff from the senators, but I really, oh, their aides, this story came from their aides, so I would not be guilty of abrogating a source. You know. And uh, I named all 21 of them. There was one who sort of denied it. And the next day I got a call from a former senator who had left the Senate not too long before. And he said, Carl, the real number is closer to 40. Think about that. Think about, go back to Joe McCarthy. Think about finally Republicans led by Margaret Chase Smith and, and Republican President Eisenhower finally said enough. They were a long time in the making, but none of these people have said enough. And uh, we can talk later about, can't forget about the people in this country. These people voted for Donald Trump, and, you know, and he still commands loyalty and uh, 70, 75 percent of people who call themselves Republicans still support Donald Trump if we're to believe uh, the polls. So it goes on, but it's also about the country. It's not just about Donald Trump. It's not just about the Republican Party in terms of office holders. It's, it's about the country itself and its people. You know, Carl, there are so many ways to um, compare Watergate with what's going on today. You can look at the congressional investigations. You can look at the, the judiciary. Um, you can look at the role of the press, right? And, you, and then you can look at the actual behavior patterns of these two men. Uh, I'd sort of like to take them one at a time and go over that sort of, you know, those two things. So let's start with the con Congress and the congressional investigations, how they impacted Watergate and what role you think they're playing today. Let's go back to the basic question of Republicans. On the Senate Watergate Committee, you had open-minded Republicans. They, in fact, at the beginning of the investigation, um, almost all of them were committed to Richard Nixon and thought uh, that, that they would end up supporting Nixon's position. Uh, the opposite turned out to be the case of, of a number of them. Even Howard Baker, uh, what did the president know and, and when did he know it? Baker started out with a secret arrangement with the Nixon White House to provide them information from, from the committee's investigation. And then after he asked that question, he, of course, uh, was among those Republicans. Uh, it said this cannot stand. So right from the start, let's look. You had the Senate Watergate Committee uh, that was that was formed by a 77 to zero vote of the Senate. Now you have an investigation, the January 6th investigation, uh, that the Republicans have boycotted, refused to uh, participate in, except for for the notable exceptions we see most prominently an incredible act of courage and also competence by Liz, Liz Cheney, astonishing. And, and that investigation is only 
three months in now, you know, the Watergate investigation went on a lot longer. But what has been produced, this is one of the great investigations by a congressional committee. What it has produced is astonishing. There's going to be more, as I've said later. Uh, and and, and we're going to, we are going to have a day by day, hour by hour, tick-tock of what Donald Trump did, of what his chief associates did, of what his lawyers did, of what Everybody around the president, the chief of staff did, what Steve Bannon did, and it's, it's an astonishing story already, and we know the outlines, but we're going to know minute by minute. Oh, here we go. Pardon me if you, is that better? Uh, we're going we're gonna to really know a lot more, and at the same time, there's no indication that those Republicans in the House or the Senate are, are going to leave their support of, of Donald Trump. So you start, I think, from that, and then very go point. ahead from, from there, David. Well, I, just, I was thinking just about that, a couple of things. One is sort of comparing Liz Cheney with Margaret Chase Smith from the McCarthy era, you know, in terms of somebody standing up. Um, and the other is that, that America's probably lucky that the Republicans didn't join this committee in terms of what we've been able to present. I, I don't know that. I mean, I think one of the great things we get to do as reporters is... is These Republicans. That, ah, would they have tried to thwart the... I don't know. Because if they had gone along with an investigation uh, and they knew these facts, might they possibly... Uh, Shame is something I doubt that comes into play here, uh, though it ought to. And at the same time, I don't know that. I think, you know, if history, if this happened, if that has happened, doesn't work. And, and so I, I, I really don't know. You know, it, back to that story in you, that I did, and you think these people despise him. Think, look, McConnell and McCarthy said the right things right after January 6th. And it, it sounded like they were going to try uh, almost perhaps for an immediate impeachment. Or to say, I mean, they were strenuous. And then they retreated to their caves. How about the Justice Department during Watergate compared with what justice is doing now? Justice Department during Watergate was a big problem. There's too much myth about, about the Justice Department. Um, that, that the prosecutors had been told by their superiors in the Justice Department, particularly by an assistant attorney general named Henry Peterson, who was not indicted. They were told to charge and bring to trial only the Watergate burglars, seven people involved in the burglary, not to pursue as a criminal case the whole panoply of political espionage and sabotage that Woodward and I had written about in the first after in October of 1972. And then everybody's stories from the New York Times and others expanded on this vast campaign of political espionage and sabotage. And the orders from Peterson down to the prosecutors don't prosecute those involved only in the burglary. And, and it started to change because of pressure and also a runaway grand jury. Uh, so the, the role of the Justice Department was not heroic. What, what was heroic is what had been going on before the Saturday Night Massacre. And then you had you know, a real investigation uh, that was ongoing, but, but once the Saturday Night Massacre occurred and those people in the Justice Department were gone, then it was a really iffy question. We don't know what's going on in the Justice Department right now uh, with Garland. We know he has begun an active, damning investigation and that he has an awful lot of evidence already about Donald Trump. What he's going to do is he's got huge questions 
that he is going to have to decide. And some of them have political overtones. Uh, for instance, Trump, I just read before I came over here, is now saying that, that if he's indicted, there are going to be hellish problems uh, in this country, and implying people in the streets, uh, violence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's also another factor that is on Garland's desk. That if he is to indict Trump, is he going to indict Biden, young Biden. And that's a real Hunter, Hunter Biden. It's a real question that is before him. And uh, so he's got a, a, an awful lot to, to deal with. And none of, none of us knows what he's going to do. It's the most tightly held investigation that, that, that I can remember seeing. Uh, there are a couple of grand juries involved. And it's going to be a momentous decision. But I think what hasn't been reported enough, though, is the Hunter Biden equation. Because if, if Trump is in, indicted, you're obviously going to hear from Republicans, well, what about Hunter Biden? Uh, and, and the facts as known so far about Hunter Biden, uh, I think we know more. Uh, about what's happened with Donald Trump, perhaps, and we know about Hunter Biden, but that is a very active investigation. But isn't that playing into Trump? I mean, he's the one who was pressuring uh, the Justice Department to indict Democrats to balance out what was going on. I don't think that it might be playing. To, it, the effect might be to play into Trump's hands, but if you are... Uh, a prosecutor or the attorney general of the United States, you and, and you have said nobody in this country is above the law, whether you're talking about the president of the United States uh, or the son of a president of the United States. It seems to me uh, that the law has to work its way um, in, in, in terms of the facts. Uh, but all I'm suggesting is that, that we haven't got a full picture of yet of what's on, Merrick, uh, on Garland's plate. And it's, it's a little more full than perhaps right. has been recognized. But he recognized. can make those decisions independently. In other words, he can say the facts show that Hunter Biden should be indicted. The facts show that President Trump should be indicted. You don't have to connect the two, right? I mean, You don't have to connect the two, but all I'm suggesting is that you have two parallel investigations going on at the same time. Yeah. and One that's threatening democracy and one that's what? Uh, I think that, that a failure to treat Hunter Biden, forget the analogy with Trump, but to treat Hunter Biden as someone who is special is both a mistake and anti-democratic uh, to go back to your it's an un, this might be unpalatable for people here in the room but I think it, 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 it's a question we all need need to ponder about the nature of democracy and democratic process uh, and I understand the vitriol with which this campaign against Hunter Biden has been waged from the beginning by people like Giuliani, uh, others. Uh, but I think wherever the facts fall, and you've got a grand jury, uh, I believe you have a grand jury, I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, I, I, I think all I'm suggesting is that, that there's a lot more involved here. Um, and at the same time, Garland has said this thing about nobody, you know, is, is above the law. And he's got himself in a, in a rough place. I don't think any of us know where, where he's going to go. And he's also got a, got a grand jury to contend with. You know, in the case of Watergate, the grand jurors wanted to indict Nixon. And the Justice Department did not want to indict Nixon. And finally, the grand the prosecutors came up with 
a, a solution that Nixon would be an unindicted co-conspirator. I'm not going to suggest that's applicable here, but all I'm saying is uh, that grand juries sometimes say to hell with the prosecutors and, and, and run away. And then we get to the press. We were talking before we get, came out here about the whole notion of objectivity versus the search for truth. And, uh, you know, in, in, I think the press has had a hard time dealing with, with that issue in, in dealing with Trump, and certainly different from what, in so many ways, different from what it was like during Watergate. I think that, by and large, if you're going to generalize about the mainstream press, a phrase that I'm reluctant to use in the first place, but if you were to generalize about the coverage by the mainstream press of the Trump White House, I would say it may be the greatest coverage day to day of the White House by more news organizations uh, of my lifetime. Uh, I think it's been extraordinary that one of the things that I say in this book, and I learned from, from great reporters, especially covering civil rights, and, and my covering civil rights as well, and Haynes Johnson, who went to the University of Wisconsin, uh, was, was uh, one of my mentors at the Star. And I think it was Haynes that said to me, because he had, he had been uh, in Selma, he had been through the terrible events in, in the South. And he said, truth is not neutral. And I think if there's a line in, in the book that is probably, uh, there are a lot of wonderful characters and offbeat stuff, but there's also a lot of seriousness in here. And, and, and I think that's the most important line in the book. The truth is not neutral. So, so what happened in, in the Trump presidency is more and more news organizations realize the truth is not neutral. So the coverage was factual, accurate, contextual. Imagine if during Watergate, 40 news organizations were calling Richard Nixon a liar every day. Didn't happen. And yet it, it has happened in the Trump presidency. I remember, and, and I, I don't know if I was the first, uh, in, but I do remember certainly one of the first, and I was on the air, I'm at CNN, and I was on the air and I said, this president is a serial liar. And I took a breath and I said, you know, I'm not used to saying that, anything like that. But it's, it's factually backed up and, and it's, and I said, this is something that is believed by certainly most of the Republicans that I talk to. So I think that this too is a, a big difference, that, that, that the mainstream coverage of the Trump presidency, you know, what is it that we do? Woodward and I have used the phrase, the best obtainable version of the truth, to define and I think the phrase is used because it was very similar to what I was taught at the Star. A little different, but, but the phrase, but that's where the best obtainable version of the truth comes from. And what happened in the Trump presidency, and then there's been great reporting done in books, Bob's particularly, some others, was that the dots were connected. And that's part of the the best obtainable version of the truth, connecting the dots. And that's happened. We know what's happened. We know so much, much more than was known about Nixon and Watergate in, in many regards. Uh, but there's an obverse to that, which is, would Nixon have resigned if Fox News existed in 1973, four? Let me say outright. I think that Fox News is the most important and powerful political force in this country in the last 20, 25 years. Uh, it's a genius operation conceived uh, by somebody, Roger Ailes, who got his start in the Nixon White House. Uh, I don't think necessarily that Murdoch knew 
uh, what hath ails wrought. Uh, it, it, uh, whatever the case, Murdoch sure was happy with the numbers, happy with the profits, uh, maybe uncomfortable with some of the crap that uh, is spewed every day. Um, but Fox changed the country, changed the culture, changed the idea for a huge number of people in this country who already believed they were not getting a straight account from the so-called mainstream uh, news. I think, once again, we have to come back to a different perception, perhaps, than we've had about journalism and about politics. They're not separate from the larger culture of the people of this country. That there's an interaction that takes place between the people of the country and politicians and reporters and news organizations. And to look at, at journalism and politics in isolation from what 300 million people are digesting and talking about and feeling uh, and being emotional about is, is a totally different concept than just focusing on Washington, the presidency, what the cap, what's going on in the Capitol, what's going on in the state legislatures. And, you know, two thirds of state legislatures are controlled by Republicans and mostly by Trump Republicans. And they're in closer touch to the people in this country than, than a lot of uh, the leaders in the House and the Senate. I'm, I'm rambling. So to answer the question, do you think that Nixon would have had to Oh, resign? there was a question. <laughs> oh! Say what? Spoken like a politician there. <laughs> What'd you ask? <laughs> would Nixon have resigned if Fox News existed then? Again, it's if history. Uh, yeah, no, 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 but, but, but it is if history. That First of all, Nixon would have been, there, there's no question in my mind, Nixon would have been smart enough uh, to use Fox to his advantage. And it, one of the things that happened in Watergate that was decisive, not just Barry Goldwater and those guys, but before the, that delegation went to the White House, the polls showed up until the tapes, until the substance of Nixon's tapes were revealed to the people of the country, most people in this country 60, 65 percent, I can't remember the exact numbers, believed that Richard Nixon should stay in office. Then they heard the tapes, and the numbers started to switch. So that by the time that Goldwater and those guys went down there, there was a consensus in this country, among the people of the country, that was heard loud and clear by people in the Congress, that the pendulum had swung and a large majority of the people thought that, that Nixon should be forced to resign uh, or be convicted in the Senate of high, high crimes and misdemeanors. So I think the more important aspect of this is, is what would the people of the country have felt if there were a Fox News then? And I think the answer to that question is, is somewhat obvious, that there, there would be a different polity in the, in the country, just as there is a different polity in, in the country today than existed 50 years ago. And, and once again, I think this is equally the great story of, of, of what's going on here. We need to be covering not just what's going on in Washington, but what's going on in, in, in the country. Well, that's why we're having this fundraiser tonight, right? That's good. Local journalism is so important, and it's, it's, true. it's you know it's threatened as never before. Well, wow, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, so let let's get a little lighter. Uh, tell me about your first impressions of Woodward. <laughs> really want me to do that? Yes, I do. Oh, Bob came to the paper. Uh, with no experience, he had asked for a job at, at the paper uh, a year before I met him. 
he went to the city editor. The city editor said, no, you don't have any experience. You're just out of the Navy. Uh, you really want to get into this business, go work for one of the county local journalism. At the lowest level, go work for a weekly out in the suburbs. Woodward said, all right. And he cleaned the place up. He came to the Washington Post about a year before Watergate. And all of a sudden, this guy was doing all these stories about rat droppings in restaurants, that, but he was getting these restaurants closed down. And everybody took notice. And there also was a perception of him as being a little too uh, toadying with, with, <laughs> with the editors. Perception by Carl Bernstein? No, 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 no. <laughs> No, it was a subject of discussion among the because in the news it really was because nobody had quite come in and had it on the local side that quickly such a uh, and, and it was known that you know it, it, Bradley had already taken notice notice of him and so then came the day of the Watergate break-in and uh, we were thrown together and the first experience is very much like what is shown in the movie of all the president's men. Uh, Woodward had been at the courthouse. Uh, I had been, I was a chief Virginia correspondent at the time. I got on the phone, started calling the wives uh, of the burglars down in Florida, uh, who kept, who told me that, that the burglars were, uh, that they were, they were all had associations with the CIA. And so somebody had to put this story together. Uh, and, and it was Woodward and myself, and Woodward wrote a draft. Uh, and I looked at it and I, I said, you know, there's a lot of gobbledygook in here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's not very clear what, what, what you mean here. And I think Woodward got his back up a little bit. And uh, just like you see Dustin Hoffman throw the <laughs> damn thing at, uh, at Robert Redford, it's something like that pretty much happened. And, uh, uh, I redid it, and Woodward said, oh, yeah, it's better, and, but he, he wasn't happy about it. Uh, <laughs> and it, significantly, the first byline on the first Watergate story was not either of ours. It was Alfred E. Lewis, the police reporter at the Washington Post. The next day, we came into the office. It was a Sunday. The city editor had told us, you guys come in to follow this up. And right away, we started making phone calls. And it became instantly recognizable to me and to him that something here clicked. Based on, I had all this experience, I was 28, Woodward was 29, he had an indefatigable nature that, that was, and, and a kind of intelligence, uh, you know him, uh, a very different kind of intelligence that, that is rigorous, yet open-minded in, in an extraordinary way. And, and without any ideological baggage, uh, but also a real love for the truth. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, obviously, we're joined at the hip. It's been an amazing thing. Is it 50 years later, we're both working on this story about Trump, we got a new edition of All the President's Men. Uh, you know, if anybody would have said to us 50 years ago, you guys are going to be, you know, you're going to be on television together, you're going to be talking about Trump, and, and at the same time, the January 6th committee, a 50th anniversary of this book, I mean, couldn't make that stuff up. But, uh, I don't know if it's a love story, but it's the greatest buddy story in American history. Well, so that's for what sure. is it? What did we say last night? Is it? Butch Bernstein, Butch Cassidy, and the Bernstein kid. I was just saying. <laughs> we were sitting around, my wife and, and Bob, in the hotel, and he came up with that one. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, I wanted, well, one other question. I don't know if you want to answer it or not, but um, I didn't get the chance to work with you at the Post. Why did you leave? Wow. I don't know if I want to go there. Um, Two reasons. Woodward and I wanted to do another book, 
And, and Bob wanted to do a book on the Supreme Court, and I wanted to do a book on, uh, on an American corporation. And I was really adamant, and he was really adamant. And it also uh, was a time when, by in 1977, you know, there had been a lot of ups and downs in the relationship. There's this period that, that I would say was, was a down. Uh, and each, each one of these downs we've come up, come back from, and become closer. Uh, so, uh, but this was one of those periods. And um, I had wanted to do, my father had wanted me to do a book with him, actually, about the witch hunts of the McCarthy era that affected my family, which had to do with the Truman Loyalty Review Order, is one of few audiences in America that will know about the Truman <laughs> Loyalty Review Order. And, uh, and I decided, all right, I'm going to go off and write, write that book. I may be leaving out a little bit of that story. That's all right. I didn't realize that your father wanted you to write that book because my father didn't want me to write anything while he was alive. Well, again, my father wanted me, it turned out, and it's in the book, my yes. father wanted me to write a book, book with him that, that didn't touch certain areas. And, and I, I, I said, you know, after I'd been doing it for a year, I said, you know, Dad, I've, I've got to do this, and it's going to go places that are going to be uncomfortable. And it, 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 my folks were angered about the book in many ways. Yeah, that's, that's why I could not write it while my dad was alive. But I admire that you had the guts to well, do that. Well, I don't know that I would do it the same way, quite honestly. Yeah. Now, um, the book that you all got, Chasing History, is the amazing thing to me about it, Carl, is the specificity that you have day by day of what was going on. I can't remember what I did yesterday. Um, I can't either, but I'll tell you how it is I, that I that came about. I want to know about. the methodology. It's amazing. You, did you keep every note you ever took? No, I had my scrapbooks. So I had every story that I ever did. Yeah. I also went and interviewed everybody who was still alive from my time at the Star. And that was, I have to tell you, to be able to do that with these people I loved, who were like my family, sorry, who taught me everything I know, and to see them again is a joy such as I can't describe. And then to be able to put all that together in this manner and be faithful to them, it seemed to me was, was a great opportunity. And the interviews I did with them, and I had chronologies, I had every, every clipping, I did have my memory, I did not have my, my notebooks, uh, but the interviews uh, were, were in many ways the, the backbone to, to doing this. And, and then my memory would kick in. Uh -huh. and, because you uh, can remember like walking down the street who you encountered, you know, on a specific day. Uh, which I just found... Well, I did, look, I put together chronologies. I put yeah. together chronologies of the five years, everything that was going on. Then I would eliminate those things I didn't know anything about. Uh, and, and, and then I, I would try to, like, like reporting on Watergate, I would try to triangulate things, try to get things from two people. Um, and somehow it, it, it all came together. Uh, the specificity, though, I agree with you, is, is one of the reasons that, that it works to the extent that it might work. Oh, it definitely works. Um, and Carl, so let, let, me, yeah. let me say, there were about five people who, who really were important in my life back then and who the meeting with each of them individually it just sparked their memories and my memories. And, and those interviews in, in particular, uh, I, th I think, uh, overlay both the methodology and the pages if it finally resulted. You know, um, Carl and I are both college dropouts and both have honorary degrees from the schools we dropped out of. 
<laughs> this guy just I, I, I said to David, I said, the greatest revenge. It really is. <laughs> but I also said, yeah. it seems to me we need reporters today who are dropouts. <laughs> no, no, I'm really and I serious. Said yes. I'm really serious about this. I think that our newsrooms, even now, are are so unrepresentative of the people that we cover, of, of the people of the country, so overloaded in, in, in journalism with Ivy League degrees. It started while I was still at, at the Star. Why shouldn't there be talented dropouts who, who also know people of their own backgrounds and their own experience that would bring that to, these, to our news organizations? I'm really serious about it. I always felt that my experience at the Trenton Times, equivalent to your experience at the Washington Star, was like my, not just college, but graduate school in so many ways, you know, in the formation. Yeah, you, know, I, you well, me, grew up in newsrooms, you know, absolutely grew up, worked 16-hour days. Uh, and look, if you wanted to do this thing and you loved it, you work 16 hours a day, and you, 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 know, you studied what these people who had these unbelievable skills and commitments to the truth. And incidentally, the Washington Star was a much better paper in the five years I was there than the Washington Post. No, no, it was. I wasn't and, there, so I'm not arguing. No, no, it was. It was. And we took great delight in beating the hell out of the Post every day. Just as we took great delight in beating the hell out of the New York Times later. That's yes. right. So uh, I want to end it on, a, on another light note, which is um, another thing that made me laugh out loud when I read it um, in this book, and it has to do with carbon paper. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them that story. I just love that. <laughs> well, my uh, second or third day that I'd come to work there, first of all, and, and this book begins with the words, I needed a suit. Right. <laughs> and, a great first line. And I, and I had, you know, a winter suit and a kind of blue ordinary suit, but, but Washington summers are just unbearable. The temperature's uh, up to 100 degrees and the humidity terrible. And, 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 you know, people who work downtown and on the hill wore white suits, straw hats uh, from the time the cherry blossoms were done blooming and got hot. And so... <clears throat> I went to buy a suit, and I was directed uh, by a, a vendor. That, I'm going to tell the whole story. It's in the book. Uh, whatever the case, I got this cream-colored suit from No Label Louis. <laughs> and No Label Louis sold. So you go into No Label Louis, and there was a picture of the Senate Majority Leader, Lyndon Johnson, all <laughs> outfitted by No Label Louis sold suits, as you can imagine, at a great discount. And Louis himself had gotten me this cream-colored suit with kind of little brown stripes, and I wore it to work my first days there. And uh, the head copy boy, the assistant head copy boy, my second, third day, said, Bernstein, it's 12 o'clock. I look up at the clock, I say, yeah, it's 12 o'clock. And uh, he said, well, well 12 o'clock, you know, you're, you're on... Uh, the eight to four shift, whoever's on the eight to four shift has to wash the carbon paper at noon. So what do you mean wash the carbon paper? But one of the things that copy boys did was that they took these sheets of purple carbon paper that were double-sided and damn near as thick as a steak and, and they put them between five pieces of newsprint that was held together and made what were called books on which every reporter wrote their stories, typed their stories. Six, six copies all together, including the original. And so just touching this carbon paper, you know, go up in the air, you know, it was just terrible. And uh, so this guy said to me, well, you're working that shift, you have to go around 
and collect every piece of car carbon paper out of all the baskets in this newspaper uh, and then take them into, into the washroom and wash them. <laughs> He's saying, you better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> so I then went around with him, but he instructed me how to collect all of these pieces of carbon paper in a wire basket. And soon I had a, a stack like this in a wire basket, and I was trying to keep it away from my cream-colored suit from no late look. <laughs> I thought some people in the newsroom were looking at me kind of funny as I waddled around with this <laughs> thing. And the news, the men's room was right outside the, the, the uh, city desk. And so I kind of opened, I went out in the hallway and opened the door <laughs> to the men's room. And I saw how deep the sink was. And I, I took a batch of carbon paper about that high and I put it in the sink and I turned on the faucet. And it was one of those newfangled faucets that was kind of aerated. And, and there was this spray of purple. <laughs> Suddenly I had an indigo suit. <laughs> I looked like a, a leopard with purple spots. And I took the next batch and put it in there. And uh, it was awful. And then there was another guy I don't know if he had come in while I was doing this, or, and he looked at me and he said, son, what are you doing? <laughs> and I realized it was the editor of the paper, the deputy editor, New Bold Noise, one of the owners of the paper. And I felt at that moment very proud of myself for being able to recognize him and said, oh, Mr. Noise, it's noon, and I was just washing the carbon paper. <laughs> And New Bold Noise Jr. said to me, you go out in that newsroom and you tell whoever told you to do this that if anything like this ever <laughs> happens again, heads are going to, and then he started to giggle. <laughs> Happily, my grandfather was a tailor. And my grandfather in a little tailor shop and sent out dry cleaning whenever he would have a really troublesome suit that needed spots removed. He would send it, thank God Washington's the capital of the United States, because only in Washington could you have the National Institute of Dry Cleaning. <laughs> so I gave it to my grandfather. He sent it to the National Institute of Dry Cleaning in Silver Spring, Maryland, and it came back perfect, and I wore that suit for a couple years. That's the great Carl Bernstein, from washing carbon paper to going after a president uh, in a few short years. Congratulations, Carl. It's been a great career. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And Carl's going to sign books, right? Are you happy to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>